Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Dan Garza, who's a contributor to the Peisty page on Symbol.wiki. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, man, Peisty is has been on my list for so long of such an important episode to do because um, I've done some of the other symbol companies and um, I have gotten a lot of requests for this. And um, I'm glad to have you who is so knowledgeable about it. And I will tell you, I have a Peisty sticker that hasn't been peeled that's sitting in front of me on my desk. Uh, so I'm kind of getting the the, uh, you know, Peisty vibes coming from this, the logo looking right at me right now. <laughs> You're you're feeling it. You're feeling the the, the peistiness. I'm feeling the peistiness. Yeah. Um, well, before we start, so I want to because we have a lot to cover, and um, this is just uh, you have done extensive research, um, which I just love. Before we start, I want to give a shout out to a couple people. Um, first of all, Raphael Zimmerman, who um, I believe is in Switzerland, uh, very close to the peisty um, factory. He has had direct contact with the Peisty folks trying to help me set up an episode, which didn't quite happen exactly. Um, you know, this has been going on for a year or two. And then um, Tim Shahady, sorry, Tim, if I mispronounce your name, who works with Peisty, and we were talking about doing an episode. And um, then Dan and I kind of linked up and, and here when I were doing this. And then also Steve Black, um, who does the, he created symbol.wiki and has done the whole zildjian timeline and it's just a master of all that stuff um so thank you to steve um and then a big thank you i'm sure you'll agree dan uh, for all those but to fritz steger of drumhouse freiburg um in germany and most people who listen to the show a lot will remember that fritz has been on the show and did a really cool episode about i think it was about it was like usa versus europe with drumming was like the something like that with the title um so you'll hear Dan refer a lot to Fritz today because Fritz was like uh, has a vast knowledge of of Peisty um, and a lot of things, but uh, especially Peisty. So, yeah, Dan, why don't we hop in here and we start at the very beginning of uh, the history of Peisty? I'll let you take it away. OK, so again, like you said, I have to my, my tip my hat to Fritz. He in the last week or so. I've had contact with them and had a, um, a, a, a meeting with them. Invaluable information. He did, I just want to preface this by, Fritz did an interview with Robert Peisty in 2006. A lot of this information is relayed from that interview. So to start with, um, the word Peisty means shine in Estonian. Mm. And that's and if you look at the Formula 602 logo, you see that with the classic, uh, Turkish uh, crescent moon and star, you'll see the rays coming off the star. So I interpret that as Pisces adding to that classic Turkish logo, hmm. uh, the shine part. Yeah. The first Pisces, well, I, I refer to him, I guess, as I would say uh, grandfather Pisces, that would be Mikhail T. Pisces. And um, he, I believe, had a music shop. He uh, was born in uh, Estonia, so he's Estonian, mm -hmm. uh, but he moved to St. Petersburg, and he had a publishing business, and he repaired musical instruments, uh, and I believe he also was the one who started the symbol making. Mm -hmm. um, during World War I, there was the Russian Revolution, where basically the, the, the communists took over, and that was the first upheaval. Uh, in in the Pisces timeline, where where they had to leave, hmm. so by that time it would have been Mikhail Thomas or grandfather, and then Father Pisces, who would be Mikhail M. Gotcha. You know, and I just want to throw this out there because, like, I, I love when there's um, some parallels and we'll, to to the other big company. We'll just you know, there's no point in dancing around it. To to Zildjian, where uh, I believe they in 1905, there was like the um, Armenian, I think, uh, genocide where where they had to then leave and move to America. So I think and then it's a family business and the last name is the name of the company. It's just there's a lot of parallels um, to some of these. And yeah. it's just it's it's interesting. That it's, so his last name is Peisty, which means shine. And that applies to symbols. You know what I mean? Is that just sort of a coincidence or like that's uh, it's just an interesting last name to have and then become a symbol maker. 
I, I noticed that there are a lot of parallels between the Zildjian family and the Paiste family, especially with the two brothers, which obviously we'll get into later, uh, uh, Robert and Tumas, mm -hmm. which are virtual, almost almost carbon copies of Armand and Robert Zildjian. Mm. Uh, Grandfather Paiste moved the family uh, back to Estonia. Uh, now, if I back up Mikhail M., which would be Father Paiste, he was born in Russia. So, so th this was a Russian-speaking family, and they moved back to Estonia, and that's where Robert and, tu and Tumas were born. Uh, Robert was born in 1932, and Tumas, the younger brother, was born in 1939. So they grew up speaking both Estonian and Russian. Hmm. And this is in the 30s. Now, historically, in the 30s, after World War I, there was an enormous depression in Germany and in, and in Northern Europe after the war. Um, so things, obviously, were, were, were pretty tough. Yeah. And from reading this interview and studying the history of Paiste, this phrase kept coming to mind, and that was, Paiste found a way. That's so true. I mean, that's not the friendliest uh, region to live in at that point in time. So to find a way, I mean, that's pretty, that's a really cool uh, quote. So this, this brings us up to uh, the beginning of World War II, which in Europe was in 1939. So Estonia is just south of Finland. It shares a border with Finland. It's a very, very northern part of Europe. And it shares its eastern border with Russia. So I, I don't know a lot about the history of Estonia, but I know that there's a lot of conflict with Russia and Russia taking over Estonia, claiming it as part of their 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 territory and whatnot. So mm -hmm. again, the Paisi family was forced to flee and move west. And again, Paisi found a way. And that was they moved to Poland. Now, Poland in 1939 was invaded by the Germans. So they were living in, um, in, in uh, 1940 in Poland that was German occupied. So mm. now they had to speak German. <laughs> and uh, uh, at this time, you know, Robert was very young. He was eight years old and just entering school and he didn't speak English. And one of the things he, he mentions in his interview with Fritz is the first words he learned in German in school was Heil Hitler. Oh my God. Wow. So, and, and they were forbidden, especially from speaking Russian. And his parents would scold him because his native tongue was Russian and, and, and Estonian. You know, he would speak in Russian in the house and they would scold him and say, no, 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 you have to speak in German. Don't use your, your native tongue. You Jeez. can't use those languages. Unbelievable. So um, Robert in his interview states that that actually affected him a lot psychologically and, and really drove him to be very introverted. He was a very introverted, quiet person. Mm. Tumas, for whatever reason, you know, he was much younger. He was seven years younger than Robert. He was exact opposite. He was an extroverted. He was very extroverted, you know, very friendly, very open. And you'll see this with the history of the company. The two roles that the brothers took are uh, polar opposites. Yeah. So, to, so if, if, to continue, um, again, Paiste found a way. That, uh, uh, now we're at the point where uh, Father Paiste, that's Mikhail M., because grandfather had, had passed away in 1930. So Father Paiste, Mikhail M., again, set up a shop uh, during the war. But, I mean, there was virtually no materials. And, and, and they were working with brass this whole time. That, that's all there was in Europe. So from the very beginning, when they built symbols, they were they were made from brass. And the symbols would typically be used for like you know brass bands and like military use, or what were they? Yeah, yep. and that's actually how Grandfather Paisley originally started was with the Russian military. The Tsarist Guard was building symbols for him. Hmm. I also might mention that that um, there's also a note here that in 1930, Paisley started to offer. Um, and, and this is this is in, in Robert's um, interview. In 1930, Pisces started offering symbols by quote unquote type. Hmm. And he says in his interview that at that time when you bought Turkish symbols, you bought them by weight. In hmm. other words, 
In other words, they weren't labeled a, 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 a particular type. You bought a 20th symbol and they would weigh it. And depending on how much the symbol weighed, that's how much you would pay for it. Oh, wow. So per gram or whatever, as opposed to it being a, a crash or a ride, which, of course, I know those are more modern terms, but like it would th- there was no classification like like anything like that. It was, it was just size and weight. That's correct. Wow. That's mm. correct. Cool. Very different. So so Pisces was the first one to actually classify symbols. And what they found was that um, orchestras tended to like heavier symbols uh, with longer decay. And Piesty called those, and, and, and this is a translation. So I, I don't know. I, I'm assuming this is, this is a, a, a literal translation. They refer to them as gong symbols. Hmm. Um, and he mentions that uh, dance orchestras, which he refers to, which he says use the quote unquote Charleston style of music. Now, remember, this is, you know, early 1930s. So this is really like right at the beginning of, and I'm not a musical historian, but really like right at the beginning or right before big band music. And when you think of the twenties, you think of, of flappers, flapper girls, and you know, uh, the type of music they had in the twenties and is very different than what you had in the thirties with big band music, especially when you get to the second half of the thirties. Yeah. Now another parallel at the same time, I don't know the exact dates, but I know Zildjian started working with Gene Krupa and some other drummers, some early pioneers, and they were developing symbols specifically for big band music. And that's where you get Crash, Ride, you know, the low boy, yep. high hat, all that type of stuff. Hmm. Well, in Europe, you know, Peisty was doing this their own thing, basically, at the same time. Um Robert says that uh, that the uh, uh, the dance bands or dance orchestras wanted sibilant sounds, which means they wanted sizzle cymbals, which are cymbals with rivets. So they, I've got a 1950 catalog, and and they still use the same nomenclature, and they have their cymbal, sizzle cymbals, uh, and then they also have what they refer as to, to Charleston cymbals, and those were hi hats. Yeah. And they look very funny because the Hyatts have these huge bells on them. I mean, enormous size bells. Yeah, and like a little bit of cymbal to actually play on, but just yeah. mostly bell. Things are changing, obviously, along the way. Obviously, jazz had a big influence on everyone, but I think that that was a very uh, progressive time there. I mean, so so just remind me now, on the timeline, where, where are we? Because we're, you know, they, they're now, um, they're officially, so they're still in Poland. Is that correct? Yeah, so we're basically in the middle of World War II. Got it. Okay. So World War II ends, and once again, uh, 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 Poland falls behind the Iron Curtain. And, and, and anybody, any of the, I should say older listeners who grew up during the Cold War know exactly what I mean, What you know, where the Iron Curtain was and what countries fell, fell behind it. Mm-hmm. So Poland would, became part of the Soviet Union, uh, and and once again the Pisces the Pisces family had to flee. They became re- refugees again, so they were placed basically as and you know the current political climate where mm-hmm. there's a lot of articles in the news about refugees and whatnot. So we're we're pretty familiar right now sure. with yeah. with refugees, right? Yeah. Well, that was the Pisces family again for the second time. Mm. So they were they were placed, quote unquote, in northern Germany. There's a peninsula north of Hamburg, which is really famous because that's where the Beatles played, yeah. the Cavern Club. They were in the very northern part of Germany that that shares a border with Denmark. So they were basically placed there. And after World War II, Germany was devastated. So there was nothing. I mean, they had they they had no bridges, they had no railroads. You know, they, you know, they talk about infrastructure today, all of Germany's infrastructure was destroyed. All their factories were destroyed, everything. Yeah. So there was no materials. And, you know, Robert, you know, by then is, he would have been, let me see, 30, he would have been in his, he would have been a teenager, you know, 1945, 1946. 
Um, what what did happen is, I'm sure it's probably part of the Marshall Plan of rebuilding Germany. They were given a small amount of money, and and this, according to Robert, is in 1948, and this was during what, what he called the currency reform, mm. which I'm assuming that that the uh, the, the German uh, Reichsmarks were changed to just the Deutschmark. I, yeah. I, this is a guess, but this is my assumption. Yeah, it's almost like um, uh, s- civil war, like Confederate currency, where it's yes. like let's uh, let's maybe change that. <laughs> let's yes. get on a yeah. unified um, yes. type thing. Wow. Hmm. So so they got a small amount of money, and with that, uh, Father Paiste was able to buy some brass and start making symbols again. Wow. And it, and at this point, Robert was old enough that he started to work with his father. Yeah. So he was already he was starting to learn the the, the uh, symbol trade. Hmm. Man, that's so interesting because they had a uh, it's 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 neat that they have a very specific skill. I mean, it's it's like being a baker or like whatever. But like this is their it's obviously a little more uh, cost uh, prohibitive to build a symbol <laughs> factory than like building yeah. getting into something else like you know that's uh, you know I don't know something something less um, big, but. Um, it's neat that Germany was looking at, uh, giving them like an influx of cash, albeit I'm not sure how much it was. Um, well, it, Robert says in an interview it was 150 marks. Wow. That doesn't seem like a lot. Exactly. Huh. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and just to be clear, when we're talking about symbol production, we're talking about one or two guys in a room hammering out symbols. Hmm. That was Paiste. Paiste always found a way. But that was Paiste, and that's how that's how they functioned, really, for the first half of the 20th century. They were very small, maybe a couple of workers, a couple of employees, or workers that that helped with the hammering of symbols. Because because remember, back then everything was hammered by hand, even the bells. Oh yeah, yeah. No, all right. So, uh, you know, side question: Were they also doing any of the like music store, like distribution type stuff? Uh, that they had done early on, or were they just, you know, we're going to stick with this or making any other kinds of instruments that you know of? Yes. And I'm glad you brought that up because I missed it completely. Um, uh, Father Paiste, I believe, was the one who started making gongs. Mm. And, I, this, I, and this may have happened. I'd have to look it up again. It may have happened before World War II. So he did have contacts. He was selling and distributing uh, uh, internationally throughout Europe. Gotcha. Uh, I don't know if they ever came to the USA. I mean, it is possible in very small quantities. What what I can tell you, which is which is very, I, I'll have to. I don't know if Fritz knows any more about it, but I'll definitely I'll, I'll pick his brand about it. Sure. Yeah. And actually, there, real quick, can you clarify for me? Because there's multiple McHale's. Which McHale is father, and which McHale is grandfather? So grandfather is Mikhail T and he's out of the picture very early. Got he it. passed away in 1930. Okay. Got it. So, so okay, that makes sense. So he's Mikhail Tumas Paiste and that's uh he's out of the picture. That he's just Yeah. Okay. Yeah, by ni- by 1930 by the time they're back in Estonia, he had passed away. Okay. So so Mikhail M or father Paiste cuz he's Robert and Tumas's father. Mikhail M is is the one who 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 carried the company for for a substantial amount of time. Got it. And he's the one who really carried the company through the most difficult times, which was the end of World War I and through World War II and settling into Germany. Okay. Uh, And he did establish gong making, and that did make them very famous. I mean, it's just, from my limited knowledge, the only other place that you could uh, buy gongs from would be from Asia. Yeah, you know, from China. Huh. Um, wow. So they're the European gong maker as opposed to actually going to, let's say, China um, and getting yeah. it and then shipping it over, which would be yeah. unbelievable cost wise. So, OK, good to know. So shortly after um, Paiste got their 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 money from, um, from from the new German government and they started a production again, Father Paiste, Mikhail M, got really sick and was in the hospital. And from what I'm trying to perceive from from the interview, it looked like he didn't make a full recovery. The doctor said something to the fact that they didn't expect him to make a full recovery. I don't know what the illness was, mm-hmm. but it was obviously substantial. Yeah. Robert says that he had dropped out of school. He was 17, and that's when he started making symbols full time. 
So his father was still there. This this would have been uh, 49. His father was still there, but I have a feeling that he he maybe took a little bit more of a backseat and Robert started to really come to the fore as far as, as far as any. And again, we're probably talking about, you know, a little tiny shop with two or three people making, mm-hmm. making gongs and cymbals, you know, Pisces was very small, but again, Pisces found a way. Yeah. And you know, in 49, I feel like, and, and I hope I'm not generalizing or making an assumption here, but I feel like in 1949, when you're 17 is different than being 17 years old in 2021, your post-war yeah. I mean, there's people who could have like entire families when they were 17 years old and and are married with kids. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a different. So I feel like oh, he, yeah. he had to be kind of uh, a little bit more grown up than your average 17 year old because of his life um, of moving around and just being a, a refugee and all that. So so I feel like he was uh, from what I've heard, you know, let's say emotionally ready to like step in and 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 be in the business yeah it that it that hardship definitely hardens you mm-hmm. and they they you know i, I don't want to you know i, I don't want to be too too exaggerated but when i read about their their history especially the early history what i see is a lot of hardship yeah yeah you know? yeah and and robert at one point in the interview says we 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 survive because we learn how to make something out of nothing yeah I mean, there's such a like uh, metaphor there about you just hammer the hell out of it until it becomes something uh, beautiful, <laughs> like this hardened metal, and uh, it, it, it finds it's, a way. It's that statement really covers a lot of Pisces' uh, um, ideology because they had to do with less. They had to make symbols. I mean, one of the big things was that for decades they made symbols out of nickel, silver, and brass because that's all they what there was. So. They're able to, and, and and we'll touch on this later because this is actually really, really important. They're able to maximize the sound potential of these alloys, mm. which was not very good, especially brass. But nickel silver, when you look at old Pisces nickel silver symbols, they're all fully hammered. They're all lathed like, like a Zildjian would be. I mean, they put the work mm. and the technique and the effort in to get the best sound possible out of a mediocre sounding alloy. Which you know. that's kind of the whole thing about, well, I, 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 uh, for people listening who are thinking it, we're going to obviously talk about the whole B8 thing where, um, that's kind of the, the, the key to all that is like using what you have. And, and I want to throw it out now, now that like, I am very <laughs> not knowledgeable about different metals and the sounds they make and all this stuff. So, uh, it's really cool to hear about that about, but it sounds like whatever metal they had, uh, they could use those metals. And I wonder if you said brass and nickel. Nickel silver was a very, yeah, it's, it's uh, known as, known as uh, NS12 hmm. because it came, contains 12% nickel, about 65% copper, and the rest is zinc. Yeah. And it's easy to spot because it's very steely looking. It's very white. Hmm. With the lower copper content, there's no yellowish or, or orangish tint to it. It's, Completely silver. And my understanding is that it was actually used for silverware oh. in Germany. But if you if you Wikipedia, you'll see that the history of it goes way back. They used it for jewelry and for silverware. I mean, it was very popular in Germany. So it was, it was a very common alloy. And it seems like it would be less used for like warfare and items that were on the battlefield. Because I'm assuming yes. that's what the metal shortage is from, obviously, is because yeah. it wasn't being used to make guns or, you know, yeah. tanks or something. Now, now during the war, during during the uh, uh, the 30s and the 40s, Pisces was only working with brass. Mm-hmm. My understanding is nickel silver came in, I believe, in the late 40s, early 50s. And... Um, I believe that would have been uh, with the Stambul series. And I know we, we kind of skipped ahead and, and, and didn't go over the series, but um, Father Pisces is the one who, who uh, created the, the, the first name series that we know of, which is the Stambul, which is a take on the name Istanbul. Mm-hmm. And you'll see Pisces did that a couple of times. They also did that with Stanople, which is a take on Constantinople. Yeah. And even Zilco, which they came out during this time, I'm sure had some sort of reference to Zildjian's or or Zil, Zilcian or Zilkian. Yep, all those. You know, the, 
Right. Yeah. And let's throw it out there now because, again, people are probably thinking it. It's Z-I-L-K-O for yes. Peisty as opposed to Z-I-L-C-O, which is the yes. whole uh, with, Zildjian. With, with, yeah. Yes. Now, now. I see I, I've looked at I've looked at some Ludwig catalogs and I saw. List in a lower catalog, I believe in 49 was the first listing for Zildjian Zilkos. Mm hmm. Now, Pisces lists 1947 as them as is when they came out with their their Zilko. Now, I, I I don't think that there's any kind of I think it was just happenstance. I really don't know how they end up with the same name. Yeah. But one of the things that Pisces does claim is that they were the first symbol company to come out with two different lines of symbols. In other words, a lower entry level line and their premier line. So the Stambul was their was their top line. Or top of the line, and then the Zilco was their more affordable entry level line. Hmm. Interesting. Which, yeah, I mean, it, it's it makes sense to do that. But it bef so then, obviously, what you're saying is before that, it would just be here is a symbol. Here's our symbol that we have. Um, and were they on this timeline? Do you know when they maybe switched from selling it just by weight and size, or did it? Kind of start to well, get gen like like labeled as particular symbols in the jazz, you know. Oh, you, you mentioned that earlier with the jazz era of yeah, yeah. Okay, so so gotcha. so, so Pisces started yes, Pisces started to to label their symbols, give them actual names uh, back in 1930. Got it. Okay. So so this is actually I believe even, even before they had created the Stambul series. Okay. Which which is listed as as being created in uh, 1932. I, it could have pretty much coincided. I mean, this is <laughs> yeah. You know, again, when, when you think about this, why is the Pisces history so murky? Well, that's because they're refugees. I mean, imagine setting up a shop somewhere and working for four or five years, and then basically maybe having a few days notice that you have to leave. God, and 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 they most likely abandoned pretty much everything. Hmm. You know, you know. I mean. <laughs> They probably were able to carry their hammers with them, you know, and a few and some <laughs> yeah. tools, but probably whatever documentation they had was lost, you know, and that would make a lot of sense of why it was so hard to track down, uh, especially their pre-war history. Yeah, which I think this is like we're we're getting a bunch of information here though. So, all right, so we're at Stambul and Zilko, which it's interesting that to hear that the Zilko with a K. Um, is in the catalog at least predating, but it all, like you said, it could be a serendipitous kind of, um, which, you know, you got to look at it too. It's like, it's maybe predates that, but the Zill and the Stamble is obviously referring back to the other company or that, yeah. that region. So it's sort of just yeah. this, uh, cause I guess that would obviously be, as we all know, cause when you think symbol, you think Turkey, or you think yes. China or, you know, there's a lot of regions that do them, but obviously they're trying to play on the um, popularity of uh, that region at that point. Yeah, and Paiste has always used the star and crescent moon um, in their logos for all the series up until recently. I would say up until about the last 20 years. Mm. Um, you'll find it in the 2002. You'll find it in the 505, the 404. You'll find it in the Sound Creations, obviously in the 602s. Uh, you'll find it in the Dixie, Stambul, Standard, Stanopol, yeah. Ludwig Standard. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, to me, I know it's obviously like the Ottoman kind of like all that stuff, but it just sort of like is like a, I don't know. It just reads to me as like a symbol, if that makes sense. Like, it's just like the traditional, this is just the stamp. I, I don't know. I mean, what, what's your thoughts on the use yeah, of that? It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a recognition of... Of they're using this icon because that's the icon that symbolizes symbol making, and the center of symbol making is in Turkey, you yep. know. And and the star and crescent moon, I I did I looked it up on Wikipedia, and that was part of the Ottoman Empire, and obviously it's on the Turkish flag as well. If you mm -hmm. look at the Turkish flag, but that's a symbol of the Ottoman Empire that goes back four, five, six hundred years or more. Yeah. So it, it's been around a long time. So yeah, uh, Pisces was basically saying, hey, you know. It, in, in the very beginning of their history, they they talk about, or Robert talked about, how they decided to 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 it would be grandfather Pisces decided to make symbols in the quote unquote Turkish style, mm -hmm. not the Chinese style, right? And yep. we know that we we all being drummers know the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. 
So it only makes sense that they would use that 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 icon to reference that these are symbols made in the Turkish style. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, um, all right. Well, then let's chug forward here because there's obviously t- so much of of Peisty to cover. So, um, all right. We have the two brands. Robert is running the show. Um, how's everything going business wise? I mean, it seems like they've they're they're selling them. That's the most important thing. Is people are buying these, right? Yes, and and they they are in northern Germany. Um, the 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 shop that they they set up uh, was was close. I. I'd have to look up the name and pronounce the names are really difficult. Yeah, sure. It was very close to where they originally were settled after World War II. Mm. Now, that factory that they started after World War II, that's still there. And Peisty still produces symbols out of that. And that's the only location where they produce gongs. Mm. Wow. And what happened was Mikhail M., Father Peisty, um, was still running the company, but you could see from Robert's interview how Robert became more and more involved. The next next big step was they uh, started to press bells into the symbols instead of hammering them. Hmm. And this would have been right around 1950, I would say. And this was quickly followed up by, and this is Father Peisty, Mikhail M. He found a hammering machine or he bought one and he worked with Robert and says, Hey, let's try this machine. Let's try to, to machine hammer the symbols instead of hand hammering them. Now what they were doing is when you make a symbol traditionally and you hammer the symbol out, you're actually shaping the bow or the curve of the symbol itself. That's, that's one of the main reasons why you're hammering. Obviously hammering has a huge effect on the sound, Mm -hmm. But the primary function is to create the shape of the symbol, and that's the bow or the curve. And modern symbol making, they're all stamped by all the major manufacturers, except for Peisty. Peisty still uses the exact same technique that they started in 1952. And Mm -hmm. that's when Father Peisty bought the machine and showed it to to the workers and they didn't want to use it. They said, no, 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 we're not going to use a machine. You know, we're artisans. We hammer the symbols by hand. Yeah. But Robert took it and said, well, this is really cool. You know, let me let me play with it. Let me see. And he played with it and played with it and worked with it and worked with it. And he figured out how to hammer a symbol consistently with it. Once he learned the technique, then he showed it to, to his coworkers. He says, look, look, you know, here's the symbol. And, and I was able to hammer the symbol out in – you know, half the time or a quarter of the time it took you guys. You know, it was definitely a, the, his coworkers had an epiphany and realized, wow, this is a lot less work if we use this machine. Okay. Yeah. So that was the begin beginning of their, 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 I call it the manual machine hammering because yeah. it's completely hand controlled and it, it's still the same te- technique they use today, which is, they they strap basically a spindle on their left knee and they set the symbol on. It's like a little tiny symbol stand. And they move their leg or their or their thigh in and out, left and right. As they move it to their right, they move it towards the hammering area and they're able to get the symbol underneath the hammer. Hmm. With their right foot is basically a gas pedal. And that will bring the hammer in closer to the hammering surface and as they press down the hammer comes in and and will increase the the force of the blows harder and harder now the speed is the same the speed doesn't change but it's the force that that they're adjusting Hmm. at the same time they're rotating their symbol with their right left hands so they're using all four of their limbs simultaneously to hammer the symbol and this is the technique in 1952 that robert worked out and, and and this is what they use today in 2021. They still do the exact same thing. That's and unbelievable. They're the only company to do this. I mean, that to me is not like, you know, oh, machines, like you're feeding it onto a conveyor belt and then it goes a machine and a robot is hammering. I mean, that is like, it's really a lot. Like you said, it's like an artist working with the symbol and all this. And if you're going to scale to be a, one of the biggest symbol companies in the world, um, that seems to me like a 
you know, a, a major moment that made that possible to be at the level and to produce enough to, to compete, you know, what, what, what's interesting is that, you know, in Robert's interview, he talks about it, that the, the rationale and it, it wasn't for mass production. It was for accuracy. He mm-hmm. says, wow. hand hammering is great. He says, but there are, there are always going to be inconsistencies and small mistakes. And no matter how precise the Sybil Smith is, it's not going to be perfect. And he says, with the machine hammering, you take that factor out where you can be much more accurate to hammer blows. And that way, the symbols are very consistent from symbol to symbol. So they sound the same. If you want to achieve a certain sound, you do that, and then you're able to replicate it. And that's been Peisty's byline for decades, their consistency. Mm. And this is the main reason why. And that's why they did it. You know, obviously, it was a huge help to labor. That The, sure. the reduction in labor – and, and but I really look at it as that in a lot of ways is more of a of a byproduct or secondary. What was important was the consistency aspect. Yeah. And as, as usual, Peisty found a way, and they found a way to make to improve the symbol making process without detracting or or, or reducing, you know, the quality uh, or sound of the symbol in any way. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, it's. What's also cool is that it's still being used today and it's not like, a, oh, my God, we're losing so much money on this old. Yeah, yes, it's great, but we're we're we can't do this anymore. So clearly it it was a uh, effective um, way to do it to this, you know, <laughs> so many years later, which is just unbelievable. That's that's one of the main reasons why Pisces are so expensive. Yeah. People always say, why are they so expensive? This is, you know, it's it's I can't believe this compared to Sabian, Zildjian and Mino. Why are they so expensive? This is why this mm-hmm. is there's one other factor, but this is the main factor, because with Pisces symbols, there is a lot of hand labor. There is there is a human actually contact and working the symbol a lot of time, a lot of labor. And with the other symbol companies nowadays, it's almost completely automated. There's very little contact with the symbol. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, you that's expensive. Um, it, you pay for time and labor and, and quality and, uh, consistency and all that stuff. Um, and, and training, you training. have to train these guys yeah. I, in a, in an interview I read way back, it was a tour that modern drummer did with, with Robert in the mid eighties. He said that it takes four to five years to train a worker or symbol Smith to the point where they'll allow them to either hammer or lathe the top line symbols so at that time would have been 602 Santa creations in 2002, so hmm. four or five years of training. Now, obviously, they're making symbols during that time, but yeah, they're making 404s or 505s. You know, they start them out with something simple, and then they'll work them up. You know, they'll start them out with pressing the bell in, or heating the center, or trimming the symbol, or you know, some of the more basic things, and then they slowly work them up. But yeah, it's 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 a huge investment in labor. Yeah, for sure, unbelievable. So, all right, moving forward here, you um, kind of alluded to that there's another factory. Um, so stop me if I'm getting ahead of our, of, of myself here. But, um, you know, we all know everyone thinks of Peisty as being a Swiss <laughs> company. And it's yes. just interesting that, like, uh, I remember when I started doing the show in, in uh, 2018, I was like, Googling, I think, all right, so this is kind of a funny side note. I was working on a trivia game that would be done through your Amazon Alexa. And it was like, I got like, 30 questions in and one of them was uh where was Peisty originally where were the you know where was the Peisty family from and it was going to be Estonia and then like I hit like refresh accidentally and I lost every single question that took like three hours <laughs> to do um so I just gave up on that Amazon thing um so anyway we know them as uh Swiss so we're getting near that point of uh where that all came from right yes so they're still uh, again. We're we're getting into the, the early fifties, and or even the mid fifties. And any of you, especially the the older listeners, um, you watch documentaries about the McCarthy hearings mm-hmm. and the and the quote unquote Red Scare in the U.S. Yeah. There was also the Berlin Airlift in nineteen forty nine, I believe, where Stalin completely cut off Berlin from the West, uh, because Berlin is actually very deep into East Germany. Um, but it was accessible and it was basically a Western city. And it was long, long story short. Um, 
there was the big fear of encroaching communism, of Stalin and the Soviet Union moving in further, further west into Germany. And Robert was really afraid of that. So he didn't want to stay in Germany. And one of the things that they tried in the late 40s, early 50s, you know, the Paiste family uh, applied for refugee status and tried to get visas uh, into the U.S. and I think even Canada. And the U.S. and Canada had quotas. And I believe the, the, the Paiste family was officially Estonian and the quota for the number of Estonians that the U.S. would, would let into the country after World War II had already been fulfilled. Hmm. So they couldn't get in the U.S. Jeez. So the next thought was, well, what about Sweden or Switzerland? Because Switzerland was neutral during the war, and so was Sweden. So they took a, I believe they took a trip uh, to Switzerland, and that kind of sealed the deal as far as you know, Robert really liked the area. And it was Robert himself on his own, because now we're talking he's, Robert would have been around 20 years old hmm. if he was born in 1932. He would have been 20 in 1952. So he decided to move on his own down to Switzerland and set up a shop. And he was in a single room by himself making symbols. Man. What a tough, he's a tough dude. <laughs> yeah. W once again, Peisty found a way. Yeah. So, and this is, this is important, obviously part of history, but also um, Father Peisty, Mikhail M. stayed in Germany. And we'll find that that German plan or German factory um, was run by him. Mm -hmm. And he stayed there the rest of his life until 1963 when he passed away. So the company was under his name, and he owned the company. But Robert really, obviously, was the driving force, and he was the, the the creative spark of the company. And he ventured off on his own to set up, you know, a new location in Switzerland. Mm. And Tumas was still very young; he was still in high school. He was seven years younger, so he only would have been about 13 years old. Okay. I was going to ask, what about Tumas this whole time? But but so he's he's just a kid. Yeah, he's still just a kid. So he's, he, I know, didn't travel with him initially. Now, I don't know when Tumas joined him, but I do know that once we get into the late 50s, or not even the late 50s, 55, 56, um, Robert is looking for a new alloy because remember he's working with nickel silver and brass still mm -hmm. and he's and he's producing the zilco and the stambul series still he's obviously he knows about b20 robert does and it's not something that is available pretty much anywhere in europe mm -hmm. again we're still in the reconstruction era after world war ii sure. where countries are still really reeling from all the damage from the war, you know, we're only six, seven years, maybe eight years after World War II. Yeah. So um, there are foundries and rolling mills in Switzerland, and he starts to visit them, and he finds a mill that's just across the lake from where he settled in Notwell, Switzerland. It's just right across. I looked at it on the map, and it the company, which became Swiss Metal, uh, made... B20 bronze and rolled it and produced blanks for the Swiss mint. And the reason why they did this is because Swiss coins were made from B20 bronze. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. So it was happenstance that Robert picked that location where he settled. And the fact that the only mill in all of Switzerland that produced B20 bronze was across the lake from him. Wow. He finally so, gets, a, I mean, he's had some breaks, but he's had to find yeah. a way. But finally, it's like, all right, here's a little something. <laughs> here's some, yeah. some B20 for you. Wow. Now, there's a couple of things to think about, too. We back up just a tiny little bit. Number yep. one, if he would have settled there, who knows how long would it have taken to, to, to gain access to B20? It could have been decades. Mm. Yeah. You know, so Peisty may have only been a, a small company in Germany that built dongs and maybe some symbols on the side. Another thing to think about, too, is that 
if the United States had let the pa- the Paiste family in or Canada, they would have been here making symbols yeah. since 1950 or 1948. And they would have had plenty of access to B20. I mean, they could have bought it from Zildjian at that point if Zildjian was willing to sell it to them. You know? Yeah. I mean, or or if they – and again, the reason why they didn't have their own foundry is because it's expensive. And the rolling machines are expensive. You know, this this is something that – they just couldn't afford. And I think about if Pisces would have settled here in, like, say, 1948, you know, what would it have been like? You know, what would have the company been like? Because, you know, obviously, the United States is the land of plenty. Mm-hmm. So the, the resources are virtually, you know, unlimited. So I, I just, you know, I just think about that and just, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it all works out in it. There's a certain... um I don't know. There's a certain thing about it being a Swiss, you know, it's just a different, it has a vibe to it. Even just the, like other, like, like Meinl in Germany. It's like, you think that's a German symbol. And obviously we now yeah. know that Pisces, but there's just a certain something about yeah. even the colors, the red and the white. It's just like, it feels Swiss, which just, uh, you know, it's cool. It's just, yeah. um, and then there's all the other, you know, the sound and the metal and all that on top of it. But, um, yeah, it's in a different universe. Maybe they're here, you know, they're based out of like uh, Michigan or something, you know? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. So, so the story goes on with Robert in that, okay, so the mill would, would roll the material, but it was really thick and there's no way that Robert can make symbols out of them. You've seen the videos of like Zildjian and Sabian when they're rolling out the ingots, they end up looking like a big potato chip. They're kind of oval shaped and they're very thin. You know, they're close to the, the thickness of what the symbol will end up being. Yeah. So the the mill couldn't roll it any thinner. And and this is what's called a hot rolling stage because the material is hot and the rollers have to be cooled. And this is a big, big mill, you know. So th- these are huge machines. This is this is a you know, if you look on YouTube for like steel production. You know, you'll see these videos of them running, the, running these glowing hot bars through Earth. these huge rollers that are just being drenched with water to keep them cool so they don't lose their hardness. Yeah. You know, and they roll them back and forth to, to thin it out and lengthen it. And they may only, you know, squish it a few, few millimeters or, you know, in freedom units, they would say maybe a tenth of an inch or mm-hmm. less. Freedom At any units, rate, yeah. <laughs> Robert took these samples all over Switzerland to all these different mills. And none of them could roll it any thinner. And, you know, he was about ready to give up. And I believe that he went back to the same mill and there was an old master there. And he says, well, we have a defunct mill down the street. It's shut down, but you're more than welcome to use it. And it has a hot rolling stage, which I assume means that it has an oven where you heat up the blank and then you can roll it. So they gave him a worker to go with him. And Robert spent umpteen hours in there rolling and rolling and rolling. And I believe one of the things with B20, because it's very brittle, and you have to really fiddle with the temperatures and how hot you heat it, how quickly you, you cool it. Yeah. You know, what temperature is it is it at when you're actually rolling it? If you don't get it right, it cracks. And it just is constantly cracking. Very brittle material. It's very hard to get it where it's malleable enough that you could shape it and and roll it that thin. Well, Peisty found a way. Hmm. Robert figured it out. Through trial and error, he figured out how to roll these B20 blanks thin enough that it could make symbols from them. He went back to the main mill and he showed the master what he had done. And he says, well, if you could do it, we can do it. So Robert showed the mill how to roll the B20 in such a way that they could get it thin enough that it wouldn't crack. That was Swiss metal. Yeah. Swiss metal provided B20 blanks to Peisty from 1957 to 1994. The reason why Peisty discontinued 602s and cell creations was because Swiss metal went out of business. Oh, wow. The company is obviously Swiss metal, right? Yeah. Man. Yeah. Now they actually, my understanding is they actually were sold at some point and they're under under a different owner and I actually did I looked them up and they were actually bought by the Chinese at some point and they were sold again recently. Hmm. So they did resurface. Jeez. But they don't produce B20 anymore, not since ninety four. 
Man, you know, it's just like it's almost like uh, a movie. And I know I've said that in other episodes about different scenarios, but like Robert, this young guy, he's like, well, you know, well, we have a defunct, you know, we have another mill you can go down to down the road. And he's like, oh, yeah, of course. And then he goes and checks it out. I mean, he's a young guy doing basically research and development. I mean, he's doing R&D down there. Yeah. Over yep. and over. And then there's like a montage scene and the symbols are breaking <laughs> and he's throwing them and, <laughs> and he fixes it. And, you know, I think that I think they need to make a movie, a documentary out of this. Man. Exactly. Cool. <laughs> yeah. As long as it has a montage, uh, it's going to be good. Um, wow. That's just unbelievable that it, that it worked out that way. And so correct me if I'm wrong, though, that that machine and everything they were using would have been previously used for, I'm sure, a lot of other things, but for making um, coins as well. Right. Yeah, or other, I mean, it's basically you know, it's it's a machine that has two big rollers, and mm-hmm. you're just you're squishing the metal down. You you basically have a sheet, and you squish the metal down so it's so it's thinner and thinner. You're reducing the thickness, sure, and you're increasing the length of the material. Wow, and and it could be used. I, I mean, the thing is, is that they didn't necessarily roll B twenty with it because Swiss metal produced steel and copper and aluminum. I mean, they produced all different types of metals. And they're produced in all different shapes, you know, in bars and in in uh, and, uh, uh, um, rods and plates. You know, it depends on the customer. You know, they have a standard. If 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 you look up, you could find it um, on several different company sites. Um, yeah, there's there's standard the kind of dimensions for these materials that that you can buy to work with. Yeah, you know? and it's used in manufacturing, used in everything. You know. So it, it, B20 was not a common material uh, in, in the, for, for industrial use. In fact, it was, I don't, as far as I know, it wasn't used at all for industrial use, but the Swiss Mint used it in their coins. Hmm. And that's why this company, I, I, I can't pronounce the name, uh, 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 Fritz pronounced it, it's, but it's too hard for me to sure. pronounce. Yeah, yeah. Who, who became Swiss Metal. Were the only ones that work with B twenty and actually rolled it out, but just not thin enough to make a symbol. Now, all right. So explain a little bit about he would leave with what he had rolled and go back to the Peisty Swiss factory to hammer out the symbol. Is that basically the process? Uh, it, he would just drive across the lake. I mean, you have to drive around the lake. Yeah. To his shop, which you know. I'm sure it was like, you know, kind of like a little garage with a house or something, which I, which I believe is still there. It's still because that's that's where the Peisty factory is now. And there is a little house there in the back. So I'm assuming that's his original little shop hmm. that he set up. And it was 57 when he started to produce what was called the Super Formula 602. Wow. Awesome. So that was Peisty's first B20 symbol. And and that was the six, the Formula 602. They they dropped the name Super and it became the Formula 602 in, in 59. Wow, which is such an iconic symbol. I mean, that's uh So was as we're in that, you know, I mean, was the world noticing more? Like let's talk about maybe like their um obviously they've been doing it for a long time and it's been, you know, I mean, a lot of hardships, but uh you know, 57, 58, 59, we're getting into pretty modern. This isn't as much yeah. like, you know, uh, war torn Europe as much as it was like a decade before. W- were things, were they getting more attention worldwide? Ludwig. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is perfect timing. Yep. You know, this is really a whole chapter in itself, but there's the Ludwig chapter. Now to, to back up Robert, refers or mentions at the end of his interview about how Ludwig Sr., uh, Bill Ludwig Sr., who, who is, who he's, he's the, if people don't know much about Ludwig history, he, he emigrated from Germany, I believe, at the turn of the century. And he is the one who invented the first, not the first, but, the, but, but a good, a high quality uh, bass drum pedal. That's how he founded the Ludwig business. Yeah. Uh, and in the, really early 1900s. Yeah, 1909 I think is the accepted There you go. Number. Okay. Yeah. So um I don't know how I, I I'm going to make an assumption here that grand that father Peisty, Mikhail M had either sold him or had some sort of business 
dealings with them before World War II. As a distributor, as like a music store kind of... Well, the only thing I can think of is that maybe he made gongs for Ludwig. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. Now, I don't have... There's no information on this. I, I can ask Fritz to see if Fritz, Fritz knows anything. But what I do know in Robert's interview uh, with Fritz is that he mentions that after World War II, and I'm assuming that this is in the late 40s, um, uh, Bill Ludwig Sr. sent the Peisty family care packages, hmm. which is basically like food. And I think I, I, I'm assuming that that was a common thing during the reconstruction after World War II was we would send like the Blue Cross would send um, uh, a care packages to Europe. Sure. But but these were specifically from uh, Bill Ludwig Sr. to the Peisty family. So there was wow. some contact there after World War II. Yeah. But the story really picks up uh, in, in the late 50s. And this also, again, is when when Robert is getting the Swiss factory up and running. So obviously he must have hired a few workers. I mean, he obviously must be expanding. At the same time, he's also developing B-20. He started to produce the Super Formula 602. Um, they strike a deal, and I don't know if it was Father Pisces or Robert, or I, I would assume that it would be it would be Mikhail, because Tumas, I think, is still too young. Tumas became the marketing sales side, and he handled all the business mm. once he once he came uh, t- you know, to the fore. Uh, 57 is when Ludwig first lists the, what was called the Ludwig three star symbol, uh, in their catalog. That's 1957. Mm. Um, now initially those are only produced in Germany. So that would have been father Pisces. Cause remember father Pisces is running the German factory and he ran it pretty much until he died in 63. Mm, yeah. So now you have, two separate entities that are still connected together. And you're starting to see the parallel between, in a lot of ways, between Armin and Robert Zildjian. Yep, exactly. The, 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 the Canadian ASCO plant and then, and then the, the Massachusetts uh, 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 factory. Um, yeah. So they did start to produce uh, these symbols for Ludwig, and it was huge. Uh, Ludwig was ordering 20,000 of these symbols a Per year, and and these were Stambouls. The higher end of the Zilco or yeah. the Stambul would be their yeah. top. Yeah, yeah. The, these were the Peisty Stambouls. They were just restamped a uh, Ludwig Peisty. Uh, the early ones didn't have a location because they they came out of Germany. But once a Swiss plant came online, you started to see made in Germany or Swiss made, which mm. would have been post fifty seven. Gotcha. Um, and these were nickel silver symbols. Um. Yeah, this was huge for Peisty. And I, I think really this relationship with Ludwig really made them who, who they are today. Yeah, I mean, that's you your know? like your funding. I mean, you're like, that's like, you're not sell, yeah. selling 20,000 symbols, you know, in yeah. a year or whatever. That's just like unbelievable. So I mean, by today's standard, that's nothing. I read somewhere sure. that Sabian recently uh, surpassed the 800,000 mark of producing symbols a year. <laughs> God. Yeah, I, I could be completely wrong with it, but I recently I remember somewhere saw that. Yeah, but but that's about eighteen hundred symbols a month for Piesty. Yeah, so obviously Ludwig was by far their largest customer. Yeah, in night, I mean, but this that's that's twenty twenty one. This this is nineteen. We're talking nineteen, you know, fifty fifty seven, seven. fifty eight. So that's a different yeah. world. Yeah. So both plants are now online. They're both pumping out Ludwig symbols, uh, and they're both doing well. And 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 uh, not well. The Swiss plan is starting to produce six o twos. Ivor Arbiter comes into the picture in nineteen sixty two. He owned Drum City in yeah. uh, London, so he became the uh, the UK Pisces distributor in nineteen sixty two, and was another big influence on Pisces because obviously the, the demand sure. Uh, the relationship was so strong that uh, and, uh, and uh, Arbiter was such a big influence that Pisces actually redid their logos and added custom or Arbiter custom above the Formula 602 name. Wow. So you'll see out there uh, 602s and either uh, some lower line Pisces where it says custom over it. Hmm. And a famous uh, user of that is Charlie Watts for decades had a 16 inch 602 thin crash. That was an Arbiter custom that he had bought in the mid sixties. That is so cool. And he played it all the way through, I believe the eighties 
until it cracked at some point, maybe in the mid nineties, early nineties. I'm sure the cracked symbol is somewhere is in his like collection. <laughs> I would imagine it's probably very valuable. <laughs> Jeez. So Ivor Arbiter recommended to Bill Ludwig. This would be Bill Ludwig uh, Jr. Now that uh, he should carry Pisces top of the line symbols, which is the six Oh twos. So this would have been in probably around 63, 64. And Ludwig did make a trip to Peisty, um to look at the factory, and they did decide to carry the 6R2s. Mm. Uh, Bill Ludwig worked closely with a gentleman by the name of Bob Yeager, who owned uh, what is called the uh, Pro Drum Shop in Hollywood, sure. which still exists today and is run by his sons. Um, Bob Yeager was a big influence, especially on the West Coast, mm-hmm. on drummers and music. Kind of an American Ivor Arbiter in a way, yes, you know? Yes, yeah, and he was, I believe, Ludwig's biggest uh, customer uh, for Ludwig drums. Right. I, I was, I, I, I'm, I could be wrong, but, but I'm under the assumption that he sold the, the most, he, you know, the most Ludwig drums. Yeah, I can see that. Um, and he was selling the, uh, the, the, the Ludwig Pisces symbols at the same time. Um, this also coincided with the British invasion and the Beatles in 64 with the huge explosion in demand for drums for kids. Once they saw Ringo oh, yeah. on, uh, on the Ed Sullivan show and he, that black oyster pearl set with the Ludwig stenciled name on the top of the drum head just, you know, blew up the industry. I mean, it just, it just blew up Ludwig's, you know, volume and sales. They had to run three shifts around the clock yeah 24 7 for sure enough and obviously the demand for symbols went up too so obviously peisty was doing well very well with yeah. this man the right company to be hooked up with i mean yes what that really absolutely game changer peisty definitely found a way and they made the right contact at the right time with with both the ludwigs yeah. junior and senior yeah for sure so um Bob Yeager was kind of a, um, a, a technical con- consultant to uh, Bill Ludwig when they went over to Peisty, and they looked at the 602s, they played them, they tested them, and um, Bob Yeager felt that they were too heavy for each description, whether it was a, a thin crash, a thin, a medium, medium ride, or heavy, they felt that the weight of the, weight of the symbol itself was too heavy for that particular designation. So they basically told Peisty, you need to make your symbols X amount thinner. They specified a certain amount. So Peisty literally all the way across their line made all of their 602s thinner for them, which would come and bite them in the end, big time. Oh, yeah. What happened? <laughs> you know, Ludwig started uh, distributing 602s, and obviously they're really popular, and they did really well. And then they started cracking. Oh, boy. Yeah. And at, at some point... Uh, Bill Ludwig Jr. told Peisty, look, you know, we've been replacing all these symbols. We've got a, a warehouse or, or a vault full of these cracked symbols. You know, you guys need to do something. We need to return some of these to you. Mm. So both Robert and Tumas came over. This, this, I'm assuming it would have been probably late 60s, maybe 68, 69, something like that. They came over to Chicago. Uh, they looked at the symbols. Uh, Bill Ludwig Jr. took them to a show. And I, I don't know if it was a rock. I assume it was probably some kind of pop or rock band. And Robert and Tumas were, were on the side of the stage, and they watched the drummer play and watched him crack a cymbal on stage <laughs> during the, the performance in front of them. Uh-oh. And they turned to Bill Ludwig, and it says, your, your drummers are hitting our cymbals way too hard. They're cracking because they're hitting them too hard. They're too thin. Hmm. So, you know, there's two sides of the story, and, and, and I've got Bill Ludwig's book, where he talks about it. And and Robert Pisey also talks quite a bit about it uh, in his interview. And there's definitely two sides of the story. Robert claims that they did replace the symbols. Uh, Bill Ludwig claims that Pisey didn't replace the symbols, and it cost him a million dollars. Oh, my God. Because of having to replace all these broken symbols. Uh, wow. But Robert was very adamant that the problem was, was that, you know, these are young drummers playing, you know, basically rock music now. Uh, and they're hitting the, the drums and the cymbals hard. And those cymbals, especially at that weight, weren't designed for that. 
602s were designed originally as a jazz symbol. That was their development. That's who the market was named at was European jazz drummers. Sure. Which, I mean, so, I, I see both sides of it, though. But I'm like, also, I'm like, in that time when there's just drummers coming out everywhere because they love Ringo, it's sort of like, yeah, but you can't really blame people because they don't know. And they're just buying a symbol from Ludwig yeah. that they think so. And and that actually makes me want to ask you, too. So, like, when Ludwig is distributing a symbol, obviously, Ludwig's not like a music store where you go and buy these. Would it be like distributed through their catalog? Like you buy a complete set and you can choose your series of symbols um, or how, how would that be presented via sure. Ludwig? I mean, uh, Pisces uh, were listed in the Ludwig catalog started in 1957 and they went all the way through. I think the 73 catalog was the last time they were listed. And by 67, I believe I'll have to, I'll have to look it up. Uh, sure. 602s were also listed, and they had the full line mm. uh, of all the 602s that Peisty carried. Um, Ludwig also started to carry and list Giant Beats in 71. Even though Giant Beats had been around for a while, they showed up in their 71 catalog. There was a lot of specialty symbols, and they carried Peisty gongs. Ludwig had even carried the infamous Peisty cowbell, mm. which supposedly Bonham used on Good Times, Bad Times. Oh, cool. Wow. That's <laughs> awesome. I've Supposedly. heard. Supposedly, yeah. I've, I mean, I've I've heard of that that legend. It's you know, before talking to you, I didn't really realize the as much of the connection between Peisty and Ludwig. I don't think it's as known as uh, um, some people, you know, like a Peisty guy like you might think. So this is really good info to get out there. It it was obviously huge for the company. The story ends with Ludwig. Um, they pull out without notice. They stop their orders. Um, they didn't tell Peisty. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but from what I could tell, it was probably around 1971, yeah. maybe 72. Now, they obviously still had inventory because they were offering them their catalog, but I have a feeling that all they were doing is selling off what they had. Hmm. And Bill Ludwig Jr. in his book says that he gave away the rest of his 602s, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. I mean, so but, the split obviously uh or shall i say the crack in their relationship um yeah. was because of that issue with the the 602s right and being yes. too thin okay yeah makes yeah. makes perfect and sense there's a whole bunch of back and forth where bill Ludwig claims that you know pisces offered him a discount because of the cracking and then they immediately turned around and raised their prices 10 percent to counter the discount and Robert says, no, that's not what happened. We gave them a discount because they were marketing their symbols. They were doing all the advertising and marketing in the U.S. for us. Mm. So they gave them a discount, and that deal ended. And that also coincided with the increase in material costs. So we raised our prices because of material costs, not because we were replacing crack symbols. So it was yeah. definitely con contentious. Yeah, you know? a lot of, um, and the fact that there's these two stories is kind of like yeah. also classic drum yeah. world of like we'll never really know what was said in yeah. that <laughs> that room. And 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 to to reinforce that, I mean, this is a little bit more background. You know, when Ludwig originally, I think at sixty four or sixty five, they were at a, a, a music show. Um, they displayed some six hundred twos, and Avidus Zildjian obviously was there in his booth. And he saw it. He went up to, to Bill Ludwig's hotel room and the Pisces brothers were there. They were in the room and Avidus blew up at Ludwig Jr. Hmm. Just absolutely flipped out. And, and I've from the Andy Zildjian podcast, he talks about his father and how the fighting and how he was really a real fiery temper. Yeah, I could see that Bill Ludwig Jr. was cut off. And yeah. this is before he had cemented a deal with Pisces for the 602s. But the Pisces brothers were there. And they told Bill, we will supply you with, with whatever you need. You know, Pisces will find a way. We'll make it happen. Hmm. And they actually, Pisces was actually able to get a loan from their bank when, because they took the new orders for 602s from Ludwig to the bank. Says, look, we have all this business. And they got a big loan and they're able to modernize or upgrade a lot of their equipment uh, in Switzerland for the production. And I also want to say real quick. That Switzerland was the only factory that produced B20. Mm -hmm. um, the German factory never produced it. German produ factory produced brass, nickel, silver, and B8, but they never produced any B20. And again, Swiss metal was the cross the, across the lake from 
the not well factory. So that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, at any rate, Heisty obviously was devastated when Ludwig pulled their orders in the early 70s. And Robert's interview, he talks about there was a lean time of about one to one and a half years. And they had to bridge the gap because they wanted to keep their workers because these guys were trained civil smiths. You know, they couldn't lay these guys off. So they took on other work <laughs> and they built cabinets for a company, I think, for traffic signals, for switches. They built snow chains and they rebuilt carburetors for the Swiss Army. Under the Peisty name, like in the factory, like the company started doing these other things, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. This wow. is like in, in Switzerland in like 1971, 1972. Now, remember, this is when the 2002 came out. You think, oh, this was huge. Peisty was doing so well. No. They were they were having to make snow chains oh, in man. order to survive it because they had to pay the workers. So they got the that's what the workers were making and rebuilding carburetors. Wow. Heisty found a way to survive. Exactly. And they were used to it. They knew they knew what they had to do because they had been through this multiple times. Hmm. Man. So yes, it was devastating for them. And it was also devastating to the reputation. And to this day, a lot of the reputation of Peisty Sybil's crack comes from this Ludwig episode. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a whole uh, that's a whole thing. That's a whole lot of history between the two, two some of the two biggest companies in, in history there. And, and it's yeah. just like, man, wow. So so to con- continue on the, with the timeline, if you want. Yeah. And let me let me preface this right now with people listening you, just as a heads up, because you're probably like, wow, this is a long episode um, and we're not really that far. I mean, we're far, but we're not near the end. We're going to split this one. We're going to keep going now for a little bit, but we're going to split this into two episodes. Um, and what we're going to do is go up a little. We're going to go back now and then kind of move around. And then we're going to go up until the point of like, you know, John Bonham and the 2002s and the rock explosion. And when it really kicked up and, um, you know, a lot of the big endorsers and, and just what you think of with these just legendary players using them. Um, so we're going to pick that up later. So just know that, um, you know, we're going to cover it. It's all. coming. It's coming. That's, that's, but, that's coming. But, you know, <laughs> my God, we could this can't be a three hour episode. So. Um, all right. Anyway, Dan, back to what we're talking about. Um, carry so, on. So Pisces is evolving in the, in the early 60s, uh, obviously with Arbiter and, and with Ludwig. Um, they do come out with some new lines. Now, these are all lower lines, and they're relatively inconsequential. Um, and what is important is that you start to see a divergence between the German factory and the Swiss factory. Hmm. And one of the things that happens with the Zilko is the Zilko was basically discontinued, and it is replaced by what is called the Dixie. And 1959. And the Dixie uh, is important because in 1978, the Dixie becomes the 404, hmm. which is actually a really good symbol. And there's a lot of Pisces collectors out there, and they're finding that, especially in the last few years, especially I think with the pandemic, prices have shot up on all classic symbols. Yeah, collectors. And it's because it's fun to do. Yeah. So. Dixies and 404s are actually decent symbols. Now, remember, they're still machine hammered manually. So the symbols are, are hammered into shape. You know, there mm-hmm. is no automation. There's no pressing. There's no nothing. There's still, there's a lot of handwork. At any rate, um, while the Swiss plant produces the, uh, the Dixie, a mystery symbol called the standard pops up, which for all intents and purposes is a Zilko. Mm. And then you see a, a Zilko standard. And from what we could tell, one of those was produced in Germany, and the Zilko standard uh, may have been produced in, in uh, Switzerland or vice versa. Um, sure. And to make things more confusing, Arbiter also started to carry a Zilko. So th- there, was a, there was a Zilko that was labeled Arbiter standard or Arbiter Zilko. Um, but they're all the same symbol. Just labeled differently. I mean, they're just at the at the end of the production line. It would be a different, you know, stamp going on there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and one was produced in Germany, one was produced in Switzerland. I don't know which factory produced the Arbiter Zilkos. It could have been Germany. 
they're, they're again, these, they're, they're all still working with nickel silver. This is pre B eight. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that you do run into that I kind of miss with the Ludwig story is um, during that period of the mid to late sixties, there was this big explosion of creativity. And Robert talks about in his interview that for years they had a hard time getting um, music stories to carry their symbols because they didn't have the Zildjian name on it. Mm. And what he found was that he could connect directly with the drummers and maybe even sell directly to the drummers. But he basically created a group which became what was called the quote unquote Peisty Drummer Service, where Robert would put together these symposiums or meetings with drummers and you'd sit down and get a group of drummers together, you know, tr- maybe travel somewhere in, in, in Europe and meet with the whole group of drummers and sit down and just talk to them. Hmm. And I'm sure he would bring a bunch of his symbols and he would say, what do you guys think? What about this? And they would offer all these suggestions. And one of the big ones was, you know, we have problems with the hi-hats with airlock. When you're opening, close a hi-hat with your foot, the symbols will get in a position where you pretty much lose the sound of the, of the check of the symbol when you're opening and closing it with your foot. So Robert came up with a solution, which was to basically press in a wavy edge on the bottom hi-hat symbol, yeah. which we know today is the sound edge hi-hat. Yeah, which is awesome and makes a huge yeah. difference. Yeah. Hmm. The other oddity, I don't wonder if we call it an oddity, was during the Ludwig era, Joe Morello was the... The, the big in Dorsey. Uh, I believe Bill Ludwig actually introduced him or talked him into him or worked out a deal where Jill Morello would endorse Pisces. And Pisces actually produced a, a special version of the 602 for Joe. Joe came over and they worked out a special version, which was known as a Joe Morello set, which are still out there. And they're really good symbols. They just have a little bit finer lathing and maybe the hammering is slightly different. Uh, and it produced 14 inch hi hats, 17 inch crash, like a thin crash, uh, an 18 inch thin crash, and then what they called a 20 inch deep ride. And that was a Joe Morello set. That's awesome. At the same time, when Joe was visiting Switzerland, um, the, I guess there was a, a fad or, or a new style of watches. Of course, the Swiss are known for making watches, sure. but they made these super thin watches. And Joe had bought one and was fascinated with it. And he joked with Robert. Why don't you guys make a symbol like this? And Robert looks at the watch and sees that it's really thin and flat. And he says, huh, that's interesting. So he goes back to, to the factory and, and, and not Will and says, hey, let's make a symbol without a bell. Let's see what happens. So sure enough, they create the flat ride. Wow. Man, Joe and Morello. That's how, the, <laughs> that's how the flat ride came into being was cool. it was basically a joke or a gag you know, of, you know, Joe made this joke and Robert's like, okay, well, I'll make one. You know, you're joking about, it. okay, here you go. This is what, you, this is what you wanted. Hmm. You know, unbelievable. That's, I've and never you, heard that anywhere else. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. The amount of innovation, you know, Pisces always finds a way. Yeah. You know, so, um, all right, as we're getting close here to, to, you know, being wrapping up, why don't we talk about the elephant in the room, which is the whole B8 thing, and then I think that's a good kind of point to uh, leave people on um, sure. as, we're, as we're wrapping up here. And then, again, for everyone listening, there will be a part two. So um, what's the deal with the whole B8 thing? So B8 bronze or, or, or bronzes that are very close to that mixture of 8%, 10%, copper are, are available everywhere in, in, uh, in the industry. I actually recently was doing a search to see if I could find something. I found a B7 bronze that had zinc in it that's used for bearings or bushings. Hmm. That's that's you know a standard material that's been I'm sure available for for half a century or sure. more. So B8 was something that was actually available, and Peisty was looking for Robert, I should say, was looking for a replacement for nickel silver. They wanted to get away from nickel silver. They knew that it was very limited in its sound qualities. At the same time, you know, Robert had, est- had established that Pisces drummer service. And the thing that he was seeing in the mid-60s, 63, 64, 65, uh, obviously with the Beatles was these drummers were starting to play larger venues. The amplifiers were getting bigger and the stage volume was getting a lot louder. And drummers were telling them, we can't compete with the ampl- amplification. 
you know, yeah. our, our cymbals aren't loud enough. Our drums aren't loud enough. So that's when he went on this quest to find another, another alloy. Hmm. And you know, it was a, it was a, it was a twofold thing because one, he was looking for something to replace nickel silver. Okay. So he needed basically, I don't want to call it cheap, but an inexpensive alloy because B20 obviously is very hard to produce, very labor intensive, and it's expensive. So he wanted to find something like nickel silver that was easy to work with. At the same time, he also wanted to find, to fulfill the need of drummers of finding an alloy that could cut through the amplification of pop and rock music that was starting to develop in the mid 60s. So he killed two birds with one stone when he started to experiment with B8. And they used their experience of working with brass and NS12 and they manipulated the B8 and hammered it and lathed it in such a way that they created a really pretty sound the symbol. And that was the Stambul 65 series, which came out in 1965. That was Pisces' first B8 symbol. Hmm. And it's a really good sounding symbol. And they're out there. They're actually relatively common. You can find them. Now, it's not to be mixed up with the Stambul because the quote unquote regular Stambul was still made out of nickel silver. Yeah. And the funny thing was, and this I don't really understand, is that, um, and this kind of comes into the confusion of Pisces having either different name symbols that are made the same way or the same symbol that are, that are used different alloys or God knows what. Um, the Stambul 65. I would assume was a replacement for the Stambul, but it didn't replace it because they continued in parallel. And the, sta- the regular Stambul was still made of nickel silver all the way up until about 1971. Hmm. And the Stambul 65 continued all the way from 65 all the way up into the early 70s. I think as late as 1975. The naming conventions of these are early on. Obviously, there's a ton- there's so many lines and stuff where maybe that's a little confusing, especially for you know historians Absolutely. such as yourself. Where it's like all right, no, no, this is Stambul 65, not yep. Stambul. And then it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at 1965, they would have made the 602. They would have made the Dixie. Um, the Zilco would have been out there in some shape or form or other Zilco standard or the Arbiter Zilco. Um, they would have had the Stambul 65. So, hmm. and again, the Dixie was supposed to replace the Stambul, but the Stambul still existed. So, you know, yeah. you know, it's like, what, what's going on here? <laughs> well, all right. So and then my, my big question I would ask is why is B8 in most circles referred to as a cheaper, beginner, more inexpensive uh, alloy when with Peisty, it's beautiful and they've been able to create this unbelievable, uh, you know, sound with it. Um, where does that is that just like a rumor or it also I like I I truly think that naming the Sabian line B8 that's a beginner line probably wasn't good for uh, the the reputation of that, um, you know, that alloy. How does that all work? That's, you know, it's controversial subject, but that's all the Zildjian marketing propaganda machine. Mm-hmm. That goes back to the late 70s, early 80s. Now, I remember younger listeners Sabian didn't really didn't really exist until by 83, especially in the US. Yeah, I think 81 so, was they had to wait eight, two years or something. Yeah. 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 So you you had a period from in the US from really that the 50s, the mid 50s all the way up until 83 where it was just Zildjian and Peisty was the only competition. Mm. And I've got a couple advertisements from the early 80s, late 70s that were in Modern Drummer magazine where Zildjian refers to Pisces, they don't refer to them by name, but they refer to the competition as stamped cookie cutter sheet metal symbols. <laughs> oh, geez. Those, so, that, thems are fighting words. Yeah. And, and from day one, I've seen several different uh, quotes from both Robert and Tumas where they never engaged Zildjian. They never responded. They never named Zildjian in any other promotion or marketing they never yeah. mentioned the competition in any way especially in a kind of derogatory way the way zildjian did yeah that that built that kind of rumor or aura that people carry with them today about how zildjians are cast 
and Pisces are sheet, sheet metal symbols. Hmm. All symbols are cast at some point because that's how you pour out the molten alloy. You either pour it in a single ingot or with B8, they pour it out basically into a big, long square bar. The difference is with B8 is that it, B8 is what's called a single phase alloy. And that means that the copper and tin are completely mixed together. And B20 is a two-phase alloy. And that means that a substantial amount of the tin and copper are actually separate. And they stay separated even though they've been in a molten state. So hmm. B20 needs to be rolled hot while the alloy is flexible. And the, and the atoms are in such a state well, the, where they will reorientate themselves to a certain degree. And it will change the hardness, the toughness, and how malleable the material is. And it'll keep it from cracking. B8, you don't have any of those problems. Mm. None of those problems. So B8 is rolled cold. In other words, it's put through rollers without having to be heat. It's at room temperature because it's a relatively softer material because of the high copper content. Uh, it's much more easily to work. Yeah, you don't have to have what's called the quote unquote hot rolling stages. Yeah, which allows for more cracking and problems. And going back to Robert, Robert when he was yeah. doing his, you know, figuring it out and all that stuff. Yep. That that he doesn't have to do that anymore. Right. It's it's the conditioning of the alloy. B twenty requires a huge amount of conditioning of heating, cooling, which will either create tempering or annealing. It's you're changing the state of the alloy of how brittle or hard it is. Yeah by all these heating cooling cycles, all these heat cycles, and then rolling. So all this work has to be done to get B20 to the point where you can actually hammer it out without it cracking. With B8, you don't have that problem at all, at any stage. Hmm. So it, it, you know, it makes it a, a less expensive alloy from the get-go. And this is great for Pisces. And they obviously had that in mind because it was originally intended to replace the Stambul series which was a lower series. But at the same time, Robert needed an alloy that had different sound characteristics that would cut through the new fad of amplified music, of rock music. Yeah, brighter and, brighter and sharper, I guess, right? Yep. If you ever, for our younger listeners, panties used to be made out of copper. And they haven't been probably for over 20 years. But if you find an older copper penny, it's easy to tell. You take it and you throw it against the ground like, a, like, like concrete. And listen for the distinct ring. It has a very distinct, very pretty, high-frequency ring. That's that B8 ring that you hear in 2002s hmm. and 505s and 404s and all the B8 symbols that Pisces produced. And to answer your question about uh, Zildjian and Sabian, um, they use B8 for their, for their lower-level lines because, yeah, it's, it's, it's less expensive it's much easier to work. They don't have to go through all of, the, of the, the, the prep stages in order to get the material to a point where they can they can hammer it or, or work it into a symbol. Yeah. So they do use it for the lower lines. Now, I know Sabian did produce the B8 Pro for a while. And years ago, I remember playing with them and thinking, these actually are okay. They're not that bad. But I've never heard Zildjian or Sabian, they've never mastered B8. Yeah, that's an interesting outlook on it. It's like, yeah, they use it for the cheaper stuff, but it's, you know, and and again, I'm I'm I try to stay unbiased, but it um it's uh it's Peisty has clearly perfected how to use this uh metal like no one else and and made it their own uh, and very special. Once again, Peisty found a way. Yeah. And even more credit to them, Minel as we know it today wouldn't exist without Peisty. Because in the early 80s, Minel started producing their first B8 symbols, which is the Profile and the Raker. And that was the first symbol that they imported to the U.S. Hmm. And I remember it distinctly because I'm like, what is this? What's a Raker? You know, who yeah, are yeah, these yeah. guys? But that's what gave Minel a foothold and a leg up and got them to the huge company they are now. And... I don't. I could be wrong, but I think they're bigger than Peisty is. I, I, I mean, Minel, which there's obviously a Minel episode with uh, Norbert from um, uh, Minel, um, and and he goes into all that stuff. But yeah, Minel is definitely yeah. uh, a player as well. And um, yeah. 
Unbelievable. And I just want to throw it out there. It's just interesting when Zildjian was kind of throwing mud that Peisty didn't uh, react. And it's just like, I just keep thinking, how Swiss? You know, they stayed neutral. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they didn't, they didn't very fight back. Stoic. Yeah. And, 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 and regarding Robert Peisty, uh, Fritz told me that, that this was the first formal interview that Robert had given in 2006 since 1972. Hmm. Wow. So, yeah, he's not a public person, you know, and that that is part of the the kind of peisty mythology and mystery of people not knowing what's the deal with this company. Why are they keeping all these secrets? Well, a lot of it has to do with the personalities of Robert and Tumas, but also – Mm-hmm. Look what's look what's look what they've gone through, and look what the competition has done to them. You know, totally his childhood and going back. I mean, this is yeah. just like uh, un- unbelievable. Refugee, and you know, not allowed to speak Russian or Estonian as a kid. And yeah, yeah. At any, at any rate, back to B eight. Um, very quickly after the sixty five, uh, Robert also produced the giant beat, and that was specifically aimed at the new burgeoning rock drummer. Now we're into 67 and 68. So, you know, now you're starting to see real, like what would be considered like almost hard rock. You know, you've got cream in 67. Yeah. Uh, you've got, you got to bring them up at some point or another Carmine mm-hmm. and vanilla fudge, Yep. which were actually a pretty hard band, sure. you know, and you start to see these bands, you know, and of course, in 68, there's Led Zeppelin. So you start to see this really hard edge and even more amplification and 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 even higher stage volumes. Yeah. Drummers playing even harder using bigger sticks. So the giant beat was aimed directly at that, where the Stambul 65 was kind of an interim series intended as a replacement for the original Stambul. Um, the giant beat was directly aimed at that music and it re- really fulfilled that niche yeah uh, and did really well which i mean i think there because right there we're kind of hitting the point of like the 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 list of drummers who play these things are uh honestly there's more drummers who played peisty than than i ever really realized um until i actually started to look at it and go oh my god yeah. these are like it's unbelievable so i think that's where we can pick it up next time because it's like you know we can't start We can't start that at like uh, the hundredth minute of this, basically, or whatever we're at. But um, sure. So um, I just think I want to thank you, Dan, because I think you should be very proud. I mean, for representing Peisty so well. And um, and we have a lot to look forward to for the next episode. If I could add, I kind of wanted to to really tip my hat to a couple of people, but especially a gentleman by the name of Todd Little, who is invaluable with his research and he really was the source of the the early 60s all the way through the 70s different models of when they were produced what they were made out of obviously steve black and i have to say that um steve black fritz and todd little they're the ones that did the research I'm just a mouthpiece. Sure. You know, I, 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 I'm kind of a bone collector. I gathered the information and put it together and posted a lot of it on the wiki page. Um, the, the individual models, you see the old discontinued models of the Pisces symbols. I would put that information together, but it was from Todd Little or it was from Steve Black. Yeah. The, 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 the personal stuff, the Pisces story, the Pisces family, uh, a lot of the production information, that's all Fritz. So it's yeah. really, I have to give credit to those guys. You know, I'm just the one repeating, relaying the information, but they're the ones that were either there or talked to Peisty or did the legwork uh, of finding this information. Some of it is really difficult to find. So totally. Thank you. Thank you to all, all of those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Awesome. And there's a ton of cool pictures that I can share with this as well. Um, so people listening, I we're not going to there's going to be no uh, bonus episode this week just because uh, this is like, you know, your bonus episode was this super long episode. That's a two parter. So uh, we'll pick it up. And then the, the next week will be um, we're going to pick up the Peisty history at about uh, late 60s, early 70s and getting into the 2002s and the rock explosion and all that stuff. Um but uh, yeah, Dan, I just, again, I'm super happy to have you on here doing this. So 
I'm going to PASIC tomorrow when I'm recording this. Um, I'm going to PASIC on Friday the 12th. Um, so maybe next week, too, I can report back to you guys a little bit about how it was. I can only go during the day. I live pretty close, but I'll kind of give, you know, shout out real quick to PASIC and because uh, I get a press pass and all that stuff. So I'll report back next week on how it was um, as well. So, yeah, Dan, thank you so much again, everyone. Dan Garza, who you can you can go to the easiest thing, too, is just um symbol.wiki and you can find the Peisty page there and uh, follow along um, for next week as well. So Dan, thank you so much for being on here and I look forward to part two. Thank you. And, and thanks for allowing me to share. And, you know, obviously this has been kind of a lifelong passion for the last 40 years. I've been a Peisty user. So it's been really a, 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 a um, an adventure for me. Totally. You know, unfolding, peeling back the layers of the onion that is Peisty. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think <laughs> hopefully and I, I we talked about it before uh, on the phone. We'll, we'll we'll talk about your love and background with Peisty in the next one, too, as we kind of wrap that one up. So, um, OK, anyway. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. <laughs>